It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of a wife. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is perhaps the most faithful and meticulous adaptation to the original classic by Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. Set in Victorian England, this is a tale of love, deception, tradition, independence, and everlasting hunger of the undead, which most likely is symbolic of the wretched masses and their constant desire to get their hands on what the landed gentry have rightfully inherited. Or something like that. No, seriously guys, if you could never get through Pride and Prejudice, the novel, or Pride and Prejudice, the mini TV series, or the film Pride and Prejudice with Kira Knightley, it might just not be your thing, or maybe you're just a bro, and that's completely fine. But if you feel the urgency to at least familiarize yourself with this important and iconic literary work for one reason or another, then Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is the most entertaining way to get yourself immersed in this relatively dated Victorian romance story. And so Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is the perfect adaptation for people who aren't normally Jane Austen fans, while it still does maintain the core themes and romances that make the original such an appealing classic. I highly recommend this film. Anyway, today we'll be continuing our series of breaking down zombie apocalypses prior to modern firearms. And so today we'll be taking a look at this Victorian era zombie plague. We'll explain how the zombie plague works and how the locals are able to defend themselves, what kind of training they have and what kind of weapons they'll be using. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a zombie in possession of brains must be in want of more brains. The zombie plague in Victorian England is quite different from the zombie plague we covered in our last video about Kingdom, which takes place in feudal Korea. The parasitic worm in Kingdom that is responsible for the plague turns their hosts into brainless animals. They have an unsatiable hunger for human flesh, which makes them completely oblivious to everything around them. This mirrored in many ways the intense hunger of the people living during this period of time during the Joseon dynasty in Korea. There were terrible famines and massive corruption, which made the poverty of the average Korean so unbearable that they would resort to animalistic behaviors in order to survive. It's all very symbiological. The zombie plague and Pride and Prejudice is perfectly crafted for the Victorian era. This was an extremely prosperous time for Britannia. With the world at her fingertips, England was flush with new industries, cultures, ideas, and goods, powering a newly created middle class and polite society. Pomp and circumstance preceded every engagement and activity in society was carefully organized into a hierarchy based on birthright and wealth. Amongst the values championed and held up by the society was proper behavior for one's gender and station in life, and above all else, one's self-control was valued. Because that is, after all, what separates us humans from the savage zombies and wild animals. Now, the zombie plague arrives in Victorian era England from one of England's many overseas colonies. Once stricken with this plague, an individual will have an irresistible craving for the brains of living humans. Newly bitten plague victims appear to be normal aside from their wounds. The only outward sign of their infections are a bit of redness in the eyes, a pale complexion, and the presence of flies who seem to congregate on dead flesh. And that's because until a plague victim consumes a human brain for the first time, they can still retain their humanity somewhat and not turn into mindless monsters. This hunger for human flesh will override even the most strong-willed individual's ability to control themselves. It's a hunger that makes the usual carnal hungers of man seem trivial. Now, some more civilized zombies manage to remain in control of themselves by feasting on the brains of pigs. It placates their hunger for a while, but it does not truly hide their monstrous nature inside. To protect the living in London, the Grand Barrier is built. This is a 100 foot high wall, and there's also a 30 foot deep moat called the Royal Canal surrounding the city as well. The area in between the wall and the moats are called, well, the in-between. In 1768, the Battle of Kent occurs and the Royal Canal is breached by zombies and chaos ensues in between. The in-between has since been recovered and now the gentry of London are venturing out once more into the countryside. The zombie threat is still real, but the nobles try everything in their power to forget their constant menace. It's up to upstanding individuals like Mr. Darcy, who is the local zombie pacifier who keeps Britain safe one hamlet at a time. 
In an era before modern firearms, melee weapons still reign supreme, especially against zombies who are unable to pick up a musket and stand in a line in volley fire. Well, I guess civilized zombies can do that. Now, Mr. Bennett, by his own society standards, is in a poor position. His estate's wealth is dwindling, and fate has left him no heir and five daughters, all unmarried and without future prospects. As the patriarch of his family, his leadership is questionable. But by our zombie apocalypse standards, Mr. Bennett is actually a very wise individual. Instead of caring about wealthy suitors taking his daughters off his hands, their immediate survival is my present concern. Which is wise. I mean, why would you trust some wealthy lord who's most likely very spoiled and not very good at fighting when you can just train your daughter to become a killing machine so that she can watch out for herself? And so the Bennett sisters are not only ahead of their time, but also supremely adapted to the current zombie apocalypse situation, which makes them quite desirable in a very unVictorian way. Her face is rendered uncommonly intelligent by the beautiful expression of her dark eyes and I'm forced to acknowledge her figure as both light and pleasing. You see, in Victorian England, it was quite common for the wealthy to send their daughters eastwards for martial arts training. Self-defense has basically become in vogue, a social reaction to neighbors eating neighbors. Some of the more rich and stylish and those concerned about their image choose to send their daughters to Japan to learn the martial arts and culture there. This is probably why we see Englishmen like Mr. Darcy wield the katana against a British officer's sword. Very interesting matchup indeed. Now, the wise, like the Bennets, find the philosophy and combat styles of the Shaolin monks of Henan province far better suited for a zombie apocalypse. See, the modern perception of the Shaolin School of Martial Arts is one of wushu, or performative stylized movements not designed for combat or warfare. But the roots of the Shaolin martial arts style is definitely one that was born for the battlefield and involved extremely advanced fighting techniques using both swords, staff, and fists. Since ancient times, the Shaolin monks have been called upon by various Chinese dynasties to defend the people from everything from foreign invaders to bandits and pirates. Equal. I for one would trade nothing for my Shaolin training. Most importantly, however, is the mental discipline and physical training that is involved in this school of combat. This is a fighting style which heavily uses an opponent's momentum and aggressiveness against them. And it's a tactical style of fighting that is especially suited for defeating larger and stronger opponents. As we mentioned in previous zombie videos, the most important part of surviving a zombie apocalypse is knowing when to fight and when not to fight. The Shaolin martial arts system humbles the student and also teaches them the importance of patience. The Bennett girls are all extremely skilled in every aspect of combat and are constantly training using a variety of weapons. Elizabeth Bennett, the heroine in our adventure, is a physical specimen. Her reflexes, her power, agility, and speed are all top notch that her arms are surprisingly muscular, yet not so much as to be unfeminine. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. Now, the Bennett women are all very well versed in not only martial arts, but also wielding a variety of Eastern and Western melee weapons, which are perfect for destroying the brains of a zombie. Be it a plain wooden staff, an officer's sword, or a pair of daggers, nothing can substitute the substantial training the Bennett girls have and their instincts for destroying zombie brains. And so time and time again, the Bennett sisters are able to save the men in their lives from demise because of their familiarity with death and supreme confidence in their own abilities. Saving damsels in distress is a bit tiring. It's nice to see the men sit back and relax for once. Allow me. Gallantry isn't dead. Come, come now, we must. When the Bennett sisters wander away from their estate, they're oftentimes unaccompanied by real men, which is very uncommon during this period of time. But upon closer inspection, each one of these sisters are well accompanied. Usually they have a short sword attached to their hip, throwing daggers tucked into the boots, boots which are terrific for curb stomping, a dagger in a scabbard attached to the garter, and a trusty musket rifle slung over their shoulder because as dependable as a short sword is, engaging a zombie at a distance is usually the wiser choice. Especially when you and your sisters can form a formidable firing line. By the 1800s, the musket was far more standardized and reliable than the matchlock muskets we see in Kingdom. The Bennett girls use the smaller Baker rifle carbine, which has a shorter barrel length compared to more common smoothbore muskets. But thanks to the internal rifling on these weapons, the rounds actually have far better accuracy and much longer range. Carbines of this type were typically used by elite sharpshooter companies and soldiers on horseback. 
The Bennett sisters also had their own specialized flintlock pistols whenever wielding a full musket was impractical or improper. The most common firearm of this period would be the Brown Bess musket. It was a smooth bore flintlock musket capable of firing three to four shots per minute in the hands of an expert. These muskets fired a 0.75 caliber projectile and were capable of doing significant damage at close range, but were only really lethal up to 175 yards away. Despite not having a rifled barrel, these muskets still were able to hit a human sized target at around 100 yards in distance. But in most battlefield situations, volley fire was still used to make up for these weapons inaccuracy. We also see a variety of other weapons being employed like the blunderbuss, the one-shot precursor to the modern shotguns, and then there's the Charville musket, which is used by Lady Catherine and her fearsome black guard. But the most important lesson that we learn from Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is a lesson about proper firearms maintenance. Because when it comes to matchlock weapons, your success in battle is only partially related to your ability to aim and fire the weapon. A considerable amount of time needs to be spent drilling the loading process of the musket, and even more time needs to be spent cleaning your weapons to make sure that when you need them to work, they don't just explode in your hand. And so, when the Bennett sisters aren't going over the latest philosophical writings of the Eastern literaries, they'll most likely be seen polishing the stocks of their muskets and cleaning out the gunpowder residue in the barrels of their flintlock pistols. So there you have it guys, that is our breakdown of Victorian era tactics and weapons during a zombie apocalypse. Now I really can't stress how much I love this film and the message behind it. And more importantly, it really does unite two very unlikely audiences, which is the man's man and the strong feminist. I think both factions here can really enjoy this film, which of course is a rarity. Anyway guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Films.